Coming up, I revisit a SOG knife and am pleasantly surprised, a gift from Michael Janich, and knife brands I will never part with. I'm Bob DeMarco. This is the Knife Junkie Podcast. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment from this past week was from Bronco1199, and he was talking about my video on the Topps Knives uh, El, uh, El Pioneero from uh, uh, the collaboration with uh, Ed's Manifesto, um, Ed Calderon. And he said, this knife is modeled at, uh, the knife it's modeled after is eight bucks. I think he could have found a way to do a collab and keep the price below $80. It's way over a hundred dollars. And that kind of cash grab pisses me off. Just saying, I like the knife, but I bought a pioneer woman for eight bucks instead. And now what he's talking about is, um, a knife that is intended to be, um, used for self-defense. Um, that is modeled after a simple kitchen knife. This is something uh, Ed Calderon talks about. Um, if you're traveling, you, sh you show up in a new town, you can't bring a knife with you. You go to a grocery store, you get a, a paring knife. They work great. He's tested them out in all sorts of dynamic um, uh, biological medium uh, tests and such, and really came to the conclusion that the Pioneer Woman paring knife was the best tactical knife out there for self-defense. And it can be easily acquired in any new city. Just go to Walmart and you have a, a self-defense knife on you. And, uh, you know, Bronco's point is well taken. That's that's an $8 solution, $12 solution. Uh, and here he's doing a collaboration with Topps Knives making a oh, like $150 solution. Um, but the thing you got to remember is that these kind of collaborations... Um, they don't really make anyone that much money. And so everyone, you know, the, you, they try and pump up the price a little bit. So the designer gets some, cause he's only getting, I don't know, whatever his percent is, but, uh, I don't think, uh, last I heard tops doesn't, uh, give like a huge royalty. Uh, so I think they were just, yeah, just trying to make it work for everyone. Sometimes I think that's the problem with collaborations. Uh, you end up, you know, getting a CRKT paying, you know, 70 bucks for a CRKT because, uh, you know, Michael Walker designed it. Well, it's much more that Michael Walker. But my point is, uh, collaborations sometimes get pricier than you think they should be. Anyway, thank you, Bronco. Uh, good food for thought. Um, and thank you one and all for watching and commenting this past week. Uh, all that said, let us get to a pocket check. Been hard to get this one out of my pocket since I got it. This is the Microtech Amphibian. Uh, this is the knife that I credit with uh, reinvigorating my love for the modern folding tactical style knife. Uh, not that my love ever went away, but I kind of felt like I have everything I really want and feel that I need, so to speak, for the collection. And um, was focusing more on other kind of knives, uh, slip joint knives, big fixed blade knives, but uh, seeing that this was a, not only avail, um, out again, but available really made me excited. You say out again, it's been out for a year. Yeah, it's been out for a year, um, but I, <laughs> I didn't know that. And uh, I started seeing videos coming out and I was like, man, that really uh, harkens back to the spirit of the commander. Not that this is biting off of that spirit, but uh, the same thing that attracted me to the uh, Emerson commander uh, when I first got it, 23 years ago um really got me excited about this so i uh, saved up and got this one and now it's got me on a microtech tear maybe maybe not a tear uh, they're too expensive to go on a tear uh but now i'm well uh, thursday night knives last week i traded my uh, heretic for an uh an out the side an automatic socom elite i'm very excited about that um i'm really excited about microtech again um, they are so well built. That's the thing. I mean, in my experience, they are very, very well built. Now, my uh, Ultratech, I think, is a little finicky. Um, 
I think it has a harder spring than most. It's a little more difficult to actuate, but uh, it's built my thumbs up. You know, <laughs> it's made me stronger. Uh, but really, uh, the the build and the design of these knives are exquisite, and I I can see myself um, kind of in real time going down a rabbit hole. And uh, but I'm going to do it differently this time, and uh, I am looking to to do trades and and sell some knives and kind of lighten lighten the collection a little bit so i don't feel like i'm being owned by these things but i indeed own them myself okay enough of that uh, the slip joint today was a case i had uh, this medium um toothpick something that uh, a pattern that they have brought out and now feature in most of their lines which i really like beautiful knife the one thing i'm not crazy about is the very light action on this it is pretty light but sometimes i feel and i'm not sure if this is perception but sometimes i feel like slip joints get uh stouter over the over the years they get uh like the action becomes maybe a little bit harder to actuate and they're maybe that's uh true and maybe there's a real reason for it but it's something i sort of tend to feel uh, this is a sunset whiskey bone, beautiful, beautiful die job. I mean, that's really why I got this because it's an incredible bone cover. And this is in their carbon steel line, 1095. And, uh, so this will patina over time. Or if I take it and take it to the diner and get steak and eggs with it, uh, you know, I love the, I love the red meat patina on 1095 might, might go that route. Uh, but for this this knife yeah it's one it's one flaw to me is the action is a uh, like four or so uh but the build is really nice there are no gaps i i hold every case i hold every slip joint up to the light and you can usually see a little bit through uh most case knives and and rough riders i've never seen any light through my jack wolf knives or my qsp knives uh, but that's neither here nor there what is here and there is on my belt today that was stupid <laughs> three o'clock in the waistband uh the cryptech sheathed necromance by jed hornbeak knives uh, a great little uh sub five inch double-edged uh fighter just a beautiful asymmetrical double-edged knife here almost almost a tanto with that little sub tip there i mean maybe tanto inspired i don't know if that counts for me uh but just uh very very thinly hollow ground 3v blade with a scandy swedge so that comes to a zero edge very nasty and sharp let's see do i have any i'm going to show you something real quick i'm going to take a piece of paper and show you how uh that clip works now i have shown that before where even a a dull clip uh, on a clip point blade uh, will do some damage. But look at this. It's going to very lightly. I mean, that's just just barely touching the paper. Uh, that's what that Scandi edge will do. If, if you flick it on something or someone, like an incoming hand with a blade, boom. Uh, you know, uh, that's probably never going to factor in to your use of this, but uh, that's a Bowie knife fighting technique. And that comes from uh, saber fighting, I think. Uh, so it's a tried and true technique. And if heaven forbid you ever use this fighting knife for what it's actually intended for, uh, that's candy ground swedge. I love it. I love it. You know, I love double edged knives. You know, I love a sharpened swedge. This is like ultra, ultra swedge. And uh, the ergonomics of this are astounding. It is, uh, you might be able to tell just by looking at it. It is so very comfortable in the hand. It's almost like a pair of slippers that that uh, you see this palm swell, the way this shoots up into the, it locks it in. And then you've got this sub hilt here. Oh, it's so comfortable in the saber grip. And then you come up to a uh, Filipino grip with the thumb on that awesome jimping. Very comfortable up there. Uh, also great in reverse grip because you have a peaked pommel over which you can uh, put your thumb and it locks right over there. Uh, that's exactly, uh, that's how I like it. Uh, and, you know, preferences are preferences. But uh, if you if yours are any like anything like mine, you will love this knife. Now, 
I got to say, this is not like a widely available knife. As a matter of fact, I only know that he made three of them, uh, but I don't think he retires patterns necessarily. Um, I think he retreads old ground with many of his different knives. And hopefully this is one of them because I think he could, he could, he could do dynamite business with this. I'm trying to bring dynamite back. My brother and I have for over 10 years been trying to bring it back. It hasn't gotten any traction. Uh, if I could beseech you out there, if you're listening, uh, just, just use dynamite as an adjective once today. Hey, uh, Hey mom, this casserole is dynamite or, uh, Hey, uh, Hey Jim, you did a dynamite job on the report and just see how it goes. And don't do it ironically. Just like, let's let this be organic. Okay, lastly on me for emotional support, The Black Mamba by Off Grid Knives. This is an often overlooked knife, but man, it's awesome. Uh, this version of it was made by Best Tech. Uh, I believe it is now made um, in uh, one of the, in, in a Taiwanese uh, OEM that Off Grid uses. I'm not sure what, what the name of that uh, OEM is, but they produce amazing knives. Taiwan is known for it, but this is a um, enforcer, basically. This is like the enforcer EDC, except in titanium with this awesome golf ball texturing and old fashioned file work on the on the spine that acts as jumping you know, for traction. This one, as you might be able to see on that coating, has gotten a lot of use. Uh, Off-grid knives are my absolute favorite cardboard knives, hands down, except for the large six inch Luzon. Uh, which is just an unfair, you know, advantage. Uh, they make uh, Off Grid makes the best cardboard knives, at least in my collection, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, so this has got a lot of that. But but this one in particular um, is just got has such great action, and it's tough as nails, but is also luxurious in this titanium frame lock build. Uh, what's the steel on this? M390. So it's a it's a luxe little off grid. And I really, really like it. That's a very handsome carry, if I do say so myself. Uh, the Microtech Amphibian, the uh, Case uh, Medium Toothpick, the uh, Necromance by Jed Hornbeak, and the Off-Grid Knives Black Mamba. Sorry, these names sometimes, they just, they just get all bound up in the head. Let me know what you were carrying today. Uh, do you carry fixed blade knives on a regular basis? Uh, we have uh, some on Thursday Night Knives. Uh, who will go unnamed because I didn't get permission to name them, who carry a lot of knives, but also a lot of fixed blade knives. Wow, I was shocked. Uh, made me think of uh, that character in uh, the Lou Diamond Phillips character in Young Guns 100,000 years ago. All right, so I had a, a cool kind of weekend where, where I was uh, uh, choring around a bit and rediscover. And part of that choring is taking care of this room and kind of um, fixing the collection between all my storage now and then separating out some stuff I want to get rid of. And I came across the SOG Kiku XR. Now, this was a knife that was given to me by SOG. Um, after I interviewed them, uh, they talked about this and sent sent this to me. And it, it is a sweet knife. Um, I, I forget that SOG has done their rebranding. I, I mean, I don't forget, but I forget how effective their rebranding has been because they're really producing some pretty nice folders. Now, they're not necessarily up my alley these days uh, in terms of the... Um, uh, assisted opening and some of the colors and stuff, but I I appreciate what they've done. Their rebranding has been so good. I am more partial to this kind of uh, thing. This is uh, their folding version of the Kiku, which was originally a, a fixed blade, and then they did a folder. Um, and uh, this is more on their high end. And this is what the XR lock. This lock is really good. Now, I have the XR on a couple of other SOGs and... Uh, it's gotten better over time. This at this point, this is three years old, I guess. Uh, and they had it dialed in at this point. And I have a couple of older SOGs using this XR lock, which is basically an access lock. Um, and they weren't as good. Uh, you would have a difference in, um, you know, they the bar would not span equally as you as you pulled it back, unless unless you used both fingers for sure, but also use them in perfect concert. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but anyway, this one right here is stout and sturdy. Uh, that's XHP steel. I love CTS XHP. It's got a beautifully hollow, uh, beautifully compound ground blade with that hollow recurve area. And then this is flat and it's very sharp, especially since I put a, a better edge on it. Got this great jimping here, a harpoon. This is a really good knife. And they make a version of this with um, carbon fiber uh, liners. And so it's even lighter than this is you know, this is a little chunky boy here. Uh, the one with the carbon fiber liners, super light, uh, apparently, uh, according to them. I do not, I have not picked one up, but I really like this. So I did I carried this around quite a bit this weekend and uh, it came in handy. I was boxing up a bunch of stuff to send out and that's what I was using. So a great little knife, the SOG XR. And uh, yeah, I'm glad I have it. Uh, next up is I want to talk about the gentleman or show off the gentleman junkie knife giveaway knife, uh, for March, 2024. This is, uh, another one from Dave, this old sword blade reviews. And this is one that I have been delaying giving away cause it's so cool. Not that I've been pawing it or carrying it, but kind of like, mm, I don't want to give it away yet. So this is the, of course, it's got a name like this, the Tucson TS-394, uh, but this is a Tepe design. I like Tepe designs. And look at that beautiful Tonto, beautiful American Americanized Tonto with a nice long swedge. Those big, awesome thumb studs that, that Tucson uh, does there. And of course, it's a button lock. It's a big bolstered button lock with great action. I'm better with my right hand on this one, so I'm just going to use my right hand. But it's got a nice big handle uh, that uh, in, in a saber grip. It's a very comfortable handle, if not a little big. Uh, it's a little bulbous down here. And um, uh, for me, it, visually, it doesn't need to be. But then when you get it in hand, you know, I'm shallow like that. It, it, visual things really do matter to me. Uh, but when it's in hand, you're glad it's there. It's so comfortable. It almost feels <clears throat> a bit like a rounded off uh, strider, if if that means anything to you. Uh, amazing sharpening choil. Look at that. Look at that. I mean, you can really literally the, with, you know, the plunge grind is way back here. There's a giant choil way in front of it. You could literally sharpen up to the top of that choil and still have a sharp edge. You would probably run into problems up here up front but um this thing is awesome i think this is d2 yep d2 steel great action this is a uh, serial numbered and i believe this is yeah this is 42 wait okay this is the ts 175 and this is not the 394 uh this is just came to me in the wrong box my apologies i was just reading the box when i listed it but uh just reading the blade and i can see See there, there's the Tepe, uh, Tepe Designs logo there, those wings, very cool, TS-175. So if you are a gentleman junkie, and uh, actually, I want to thank my dad right now. My dad just became a gentleman junkie, and uh, uh, he's going by V2, and V2 is a gentleman junkie. Thank you, dad. I appreciate it, but I texted him. I'm like, what are you doing? You've been a lifelong patron, you know, like uh, I wouldn't be here without your patronage. <laughs> so uh, but I appreciate it, Dad. That's awesome. I, I think he's like, yeah, it's not about you, Bob. I just want the knives because I've turned him into a knife junkie. Have you turned anyone into a knife junkie? I, I've 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 been like a missionary. I <laughs> maybe I should put this to better use. But right now I'm doing it for knives and I've gotten a lot of people hooked I like it. Uh, OK, still to come. We're going to talk about two new knives uh, coming out, uh, three new knives, one of them by SOG, uh, which is pretty cool, and then some good news from Knife Rights. But uh, first, I'd like to urge you to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, but also tell a friend about this show if you think it's interesting and um, share it. That's the best thing you can do for this show is share it. All right, we'll be right back with Knife Life News. Among this week's specials at Knives Ship Free, the Big Knives Alligator features a full tang blade of Sandvik 14C28N stainless steel that is fitted with comfortable matte G10 scales and a molded black sheath. The Spiderco Tenacious is now available in a versatile combo edge blade. This knife is equipped with brown G10 scales and CPM M4 Super Steel. 
And now, get your blades sharp without wasting time on setup. The new WorkSharp Rolling Knife Sharpener is here, featuring three abrasives and a magnetic angle block with four sharpening angles. This sharpener excels at keeping kitchen blades razor sharp. Get these deals and other great specials from our friends at Knives Ship Free. Just use our affiliate link, theknifejunkie.com slash knivesshipfree. That's theknifejunkie.com slash knivesshipfree. Support the show and get a great new knife at the same time. Theknifejunkie.com slash knivesshipfree. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. Okay, in this first story, we're going to have a couple of tongue twisters. So uh, forgive me. Uh, until this is out there in the common knife vernacular, the knife sphere, the blade sphere vernacular, uh, I'm going to go with uh, the new Vostid Ankylo. Ankylo. Uh, and, and really, what it is, it's a platform for their new vanchor and that's what i'm going with vanchor lock okay so this is a uh, modified worn cliff as you can see it's got that front flipper that back flipper and the lozenge shaped hole for uh deployment so multi-deployment uh but the real big thing on this is that pivot based lock called the vanchor lock uh it's kind of like a deadbolt at least in how it presents itself to the world you press in the button it unlocks it but i'm not sure what's happening inside yet it's patented, and they haven't uh, they haven't really uh, divulged that yet. Uh, but it does use an anchor plate, and this is cool, a magnetic connector. Magnetic, that's that's pretty cool. It's like we only see that from Winter Blade Co. these days, uh, pretty much. I think uh, you see some magnets and some sheaths here and there, but um, not much in the way of locking mechanisms. So Vostid been burning it up uh, lately. So this is cool to see another innovation. Actually, they have another one, another, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, lock that they uh, say that they've uh, come up with. Uh, but a third thing about this lock, I have to say, uh, not only will you not get your hands on it for a while because it's kind of still in the works, uh, but it has a fail-safe system. And what I like about that is it's unlike the locks system, failsafe system, say, on the CRKT. You don't see anything. It's not an external thing. So I'd, I'll be interested to see how all that works. I will also be interested to see how uh, what all the tinkerers think, you know, uh, the people who take apart their knives on video. I'd love to see what that looks like. All right. Next up is from Boker and Michael Birch famed custom knife maker, Michael Birch. Uh, they have a new one coming out together called the swoopy uh interesting name uh the boker swoopy uh if you don't know michael birch uh you may know his uh he did a collaboration with uh spiderco i think in 2020 uh makes very robust folders and here he's got a 3.11 inch warncliffe in nitro v not in d2 uh we've been seeing more nitro v slip in uh instead of v uh d2 which is kind of nice I like both. I have no problem with either. Uh, uh, stainless, stainless frame lock uh, knife and G10 on the front. This one reminds me a little bit uh, uh, when you scroll down and, and you see the lock side of this. It reminds me a bit of the lateralis, uh, the Boker collaboration with Jason Stout, um, especially on the back side. Um, I really like Boker uh, stainless uh, frame locks they are they really lighten up that steel first of all you can see all the contouring on the outside removing steel but also there's a lot of pocketing on the insides they get their uh, steel frame locks to feel a lot like titanium frame locks in terms of weight uh speaking of weight 3.3 ounces non-reversible clip and available now so go check that out all right the last knife i want to take a look at here is a sog uh coincidentally I was talking about the XR uh, Kiku. Uh, this is an XR using the XR lock. It's called the SOG Diverge or Diverge. It's a three inch D2 sheep's foot. Pretty interesting looking knife, uh, especially for SOG. We haven't seen that blade shape from them. Kind of arresting, kind of interesting. I, I don't see the point, <laughs> literally. No, I don't like uh, so much sheep foots on uh, on on these kind of knives but i have to say this is, it is a striking design the handles are aluminum and uh you got a deep carry pocket clip the 6061 aluminum uh, xr lock they come in black and black 
uh, forest green and black, and then a light blue with a sort of goldish, bronzish blade. Uh, these are kind of cool. I think they're cool. And, uh, you know, leaning in, if you will, to the EDC uh, nature of how SOG has gone. They, they were, uh, you know, originally combat knives, fixed blade combat knives, and then they got into uh, lockback folders, and then and then they got into some really nice folders, and then they went total cheese uh, in the um, sort of big box tactical uh, realm, and then did a total rebranding uh, re about five years back and uh, have been um, really... Uh, accentuating edc stuff and uh this one looks like it'll it'll hit the mark if if the action is good and you've got that xr lock and people love sheep's foot blades they might find some uh, success with this one all right last up this is good news from knife rights uh in idaho the idaho preemption bill goes to the house floor and i'll just read to you from the knife rights website Knife rights bill that would enact knife rights signature knife law preemption in Idaho called HO 620 was voted out of the House State Affairs Committee with a due pass recommendation. Todd Rathner, knife rights director of legislative affairs, testified in Boise in support of the bill sponsored by Representative Jordan Redman. Knife rights would especially like to extend our thanks to Chairman Brent Crane for expeditiously hearing our bill. Now, this is the this is the interesting part here. This is the definition. We talk about knife preemption bills here all the time. This is the, the perfect boiling down encapsulation of what that is. Knife law preemption is a knife rights criminal justice reform effort that repeals and prevents local ordinances more restrictive than state law, which only serve to confuse or entrap law-abiding citizens traveling within or through the state. Preemption ensures citizens can expect consistent law enforcement of state laws everywhere within the state. Uh, I think that's the perfect definition. I've had uh, uh, Doug Ritter on here talk about it, and I've had him redefine it to me many times, but he wrote it down here perfectly. So uh, that's your definition for knife preemption, and it should, uh, without a doubt, be in every state. You don't want to go from your county to the next and suddenly be a criminal. Uh, it says here, knife rights passed the nation's first knife law preemption bill in Arizona in 2010 and has since passed preemption bills in Alaska, Georgia, Kansas, Montana, New Hampshire, Ohio, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, West Virginia, and Wisconsin. Knife rights will let you know as soon as it's appropriate to contact your Idaho lawmakers to support HO620. So very interesting. Thank you, Doug Ritter, and thank you, Knife Rights. Uh, he doesn't do it alone, that's for sure. He also couldn't do it without support and donations uh, from knife junkies such as ourselves. So uh, if you have it in your heart and in your wallet to uh, donate whatever you can to Knife Rights, uh, you know it's always going to uh, a good cause. All right, coming up, we are going to take a look at the state of the collection. I, I got one new knife uh, since last we spoke, and it is a gift from Michael Janich. We'll check that out. Uh, but first, uh, be sure to check us out on Patreon. Uh, actually, wait till after the show. Uh, you can do that by scanning the QR code. Got the finger wrong right there. Or going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Um, if you do that, you get... Uh, you get to see the three different tiers of support you could enjoy and the different uh, uh, benefits from each one. So be sure to go over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon and check us out. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Shockwave Tactical Torch is your ultimate self-defense companion, featuring a powerful LED bulb that lasts 100,000 hours, a super sharp crenulated bezel, and built-in stun gun delivering 4.5 million volts. Don't settle for ordinary. Choose the Shockwave Tactical Torch. TheKnifeJunkie.com slash Shockwave. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. Okay, so uh, after having Mike Janich on the show, he said he would send me a... Oh, oh I knew I'd botch it with my left hand. Uh, so this is the uh, Micro Jimbo by Spyderco. Let me grab some focus here the micro jimbo by spider co and you know what this is this is the small version of the ojimbo uh this was inspired by requests that uh 
Mike Janich had received and Spyderco had received asking for a version of the uh, venerable self-defense knife in uh, car something carryable in Chicago. And we all know Chicago is not the safest city in the nation, though they seem to have more of a gang uh, problem than like a knife fighting problem. But still, you want to have something on you always to protect yourself. And in Chicago, you're limited by size pretty severely. Um, I think it's got to be below two and a half inches. So right here, uh, this is the solution to that. Now, he had done numerous um, reversionings of the knife where he had uh, gone on a grinder and taken the old knife and just made a smaller version of it. Uh, but here, they just decided to codify it because they had so many requests for it. Um, I love it. And I got to say, the compression lock here works really, really great. I wasn't sure it was going to work so well on a small knife, but it just, you, you pinch it all the way in and it just drops. But since it's not on bearings and it's on washers, you still have this kind of more hydraulic action. Uh, if you're just, if you're just uh, manipulating the knife uh, by hand like that, I mean, slow rolling it. Very, very nice knife. S30V fits the hand really nicely. I have medium-sized hands. I can get a full four-finger grip on there. Uh, some of you guys with giant mitts might need to come up here onto that uh, onto that sort of blank space, the ricasso of the blade and the finger guard. There's plenty of room to kind of choke up there. Um, but I like that you can get all of that pressure right at the tip because your thumb is so far out uh, over that blade. Um, so in that classic configuration of G10 and S30V from Spyderco, super wickedly sharp. And this one, uh, now it is shipping with a wire clip. I believe when they first announced it, uh, it was with that giant, uh, well, that's not the clip, uh, but it was with a bigger, uh, the sort of standard big Spyderco clip, and it came down to here, and it looked pretty awkward. Now, I'm not sure if that was just for the prototype, but so here is a Spyderco Yojimbo, coincidentally, uh, with a 5x5 five five, uh, solutions pocket snagger thing there, wave. But look at how much smaller. The, this is three and a quarter inches uh, in blade length, and look at how much smaller that is. Great, great knives. Uh, well, Spyderco in general, but great knives. These uh, Michael Janich designed Warren Cliffs, the Micro Jimbo, the Yo Jimbo 2, uh, the Yo Jumbo, and the Ronin fixed blade. Very, very good everyday carry knives because of, I mean, look at it. It looks like a box cutter, basically, but also just incredible for uh, self defense. Well researched and incredible uh, for self defense, especially for uh, slashes. You get maximum damage out of that straight edge so very very happy uh to have this uh, micro jimbo in my collection thank you michael janich and spider co for sending this to me uh it's greatly appreciated and will be cherished uh for here and evermore uh very great by the way in the back pocket this i've been carrying in my back left pocket next to my bandana it's great uh you barely know it's there and then when you need it boom right there and what have i needed it for opening chips and salad bags basically food so far uh, but it, there will be there will be more school projects and such that knife is made for it all right before we get on to the main uh, main topic of conversation uh, i'd like to say go over to the knifejunkie.com slash chop and check out shop not chop and check out the featured t-shirt of the week i love this one uh, luck of the irish I'll trust my knives. And you see an angry leprechaun with a with a tanto, with a traditional Japanese tanto, and then a Bowie knife in his hands. And uh, he looks mean. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, themed for March, of course. And uh, uh, you Irish folks out there might like this. Uh, hopefully no one's sensitive culturally. Uh, but uh, I know that Jim's got some of that in him, some of that Irish blood in him. So uh, we're allowed to do this. Uh, luck of the Irish, I'll trust my knives. Uh, if you don't like that one, or if you like other ones better, there are more than 50 uh, T-shirt designs, knife-themed, all by our good buddy, Jim. 
up on uh, knifejunkie.com slash shop and it's page after page and they're awesome and some of them are hilarious and they all look really good so go check that out all right the last thing i want to talk about today is um kind of uh made last week's topic where i was talking about 15 knives that are 10 knives that or a dozen knives it was 12 uh that signify my 25 years of collecting um since i got serious about it basically and what what those knives mean i discovered or i was thinking about these are some knives here that i will never get rid of like i these are knives uh, that i've sold knives from these companies and have regretted and i just don't want to part with them anymore so now when i acquire knives from these brands i'm holding fast and uh not not letting them go there are plenty in the fixed blade category like i would not let go of these randall knives but these aren't the ones i'm talking about i'm talking more of my everyday carry the ones that impact me uh when i sell them and i'm like ah I regret this. I regret this. And you hear me talk about it here. All right. First is Microtech. They've been uh, top of mind, as they like to say in the corporate world recently, uh, because of the amphibian. Uh, but this was my very first Microtech. And this was also, as I mentioned last week, my very first S35 VN knife, my very first bearings knife, uh, very first knife with a glass breaker and with carbon fiber. This was like a, this like broke a, mm, this was a, this broke me into a lot of uh, different knife trends that uh, that have become standard. That's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, but I've also discovered with the amphibian and with revisiting uh, the the Bravo, the SOCOM Bravo recently, that I'm just crazy about their builds. They look beautiful. Yeah, we all know that. We all have eyes. They're gorgeous. Well, maybe we don't all, but... Uh, they are gorgeous, but the way they are built, they are so substantial. They feel, uh, they're, they're just finely engineered. They just feel so finely tuned. And I haven't had, um, like I said before, I've had some finickiness, but I've never had any um, disappointment with a, um, with a Microtech build in terms of stout, sturdy, zero play kind of stuff. Of course, uh, not including out the fronts, which have play. So Microtech... Um, is one of them, and I have a new one coming in, an automatic version of this, which I am so excited for, except it's from 2018. This is a 2013, so it'll have the grippy area here instead of the carbon fiber and a different designed blade, as well as the spring automatic. So I am very much looking forward to that. Okay, next brand uh, is Spyderco. I will not get rid of any of my spider codes i have not been acquiring them at any sort of uh, uh extreme pace but i have decided that this is a this is a brand i will not let go because every almost every one of them at this point is a sentimental knife to me um a lot of them were given to me as gifts uh, a number of them were sought out because uh, i interviewed someone who designed it say like this um and they all have a um, sentimental value to me. But really, these knives are worth keeping. These knives are worth passing down or um, selling off much later when they're worth a lot more because, like Microtech, they are kind of beyond reproach with build. When was the last time you had a quality control issue with a Spyderco? I mean, you know, kind of like Victorinox, it doesn't happen often. And, um, but you add the designs uh, and the steels and the heat treats and um, the fact that many of them are made in America and it's, it's an American brand. Um, and then many of them are also made in Taiwan, which produces incredible knives. Uh, they're just worth not getting rid of. I'll turn that light down. It's flashing on that beautiful satin. And then you have the innovation too. Uh, Spyderco innovated the one-handed opening with the opening hole, uh, the pocket clip, uh, and then the locks, like this compression lock, and then uh, all of the steels with the Mule Team platform. Um, they're just, they're amazing. All right, next up, Great Eastern Cutlery. Uh, I have gotten rid of Great Eastern Cutlery Knives, uh, a few. I got rid of two, and I, I don't remember what the numbers are, but one of them was the, 
uh, uh, Eureka Jack, double bladed Eureka Jack from like 2014 or something like that, 2015. And I sold it to a guy that I worked with uh, and, uh, who was my old boss. And he was, a, uh, oh, anyway, he has it and I'll never get that back. But I also sold another one to him and I have always, always regretted it. Um, but this, this is one of the, Sign not signature models. This is one of my absolute favorite models of theirs uh, that I own. This is the 86. It's a big jackknife. You've got that uh, gorgeous uh, clip point blade, and then you have a really awesome um, sheep's foot blade here. Nice, long, usable sheep's foot blade. Gorgeously built with that um, uh, tortoise shell and if you're hearing it it's got amazing action um and then these things are made on old machines now i think that they have uh, updated some of their some of their factory and uh, some of their methods because they're able to produce more knives more frequently i believe or at least that's anecdotal uh, i've i've been trying to get an interview uh and i i just don't think bill howard gives interviews um because he didn't even he wouldn't even let the apostle p interview him and they've been friends for a long time uh so these things are worth keeping they're worth if you have them they're worth keeping because of how they're produced where they're, they're made in, in um up in michigan and they're made in old ways in their old patterns even though that they're innovating with some patterns um i, I just won't get rid of mine now uh, a lot of regret in getting rid of those two, but also just there, there aren't too many knives made like this, especially production knives. And so it's, it's worth keeping. <laughs> These are my justifications. Welcome to my justifications. Uh, all right. Next up, Rick Hinderer knives. These are made in Shreve, Ohio. Uh, I've never been to Shreve, but I know it's close to where my brother went to school and I've been there before. And uh, that, if they were made in Pennsylvania, I'd still buy them. Uh, I love Rick Hinderer knives. Uh, again, innovation with the over travel stop uh, and some things that we probably uh, didn't see too much of, like these uh, plates and such, but super robust builds and great knives that cross from um, from EDC into tactical. I mean, to me, this is a great knife that spans both this one here is the xm24 and uh the xm24 has the four inch blade as opposed to the three and a half on the on the xm18 and uh these long blades are, are beautiful but also very very um effective especially this worn cliff um so you could use this all day long for chores with that robust m390 uh worn cliff blade with that tip down low doing all your uh, uh all your uh, utility cuts and stuff that we we're always talking about but uh you need to turn this into a fighting knife look at that thing it's like straight out of it's like a folding viking knife here but really what it is is the build and the feel and the quality and the fact that it's american made um now i haven't gotten a new hinderer in a long time and frankly i have no plans to um, I would like to get the Project X knife, but, um, you know, and I also wouldn't mind having a slicer and having some of the other blade configurations, but I'm not, they, they are just expensive enough. And, and there've been, there's been enough little kind of weirdness, uh, it, it, uh, politically, not politically, that's the wrong term, but in terms of, uh, uh, uh litigation that Rick Hinderer has been, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm all I'm trying to get at is I really, really love these knives for what they are, and they are really awesome. But I'm not running out to spend more money on them because they are very expensive. And frankly, uh, I, I'd like to give my money to other people. All right. Next up is the Chris Reeve knives, uh, brand of knives, label of knives, if you will. Uh, I now I've only ever had two, and uh, they are slow coming. As I spoke last week, the uh, the Sabenza 21, which just celebrated its eighth birthday, or technically its eighth birthday, but it was born on Leap Day, so so it's kind of only two birthdays. Uh, but that knife and this knife, this one I got used, the other one I got new. 
They are so exquisite. They are examples of uh, the the best knife making out there, folding knife making out there, the way they feel, the way they cut, uh, the way the action feels. This this is hyd that hydraulic feel. Like that term was invented for Chris Reeve knives, the way they feel when they open and closed. It's like a very light and smooth resistance that is reassuring. It's it is the opposite of fall shut action. And I love fall shut action too, but that's a different, totally different vibe. The build on these, incredible, incredible build. Uh, and we're gonna see later. Um a couple knives down when you combine these two knives you get a third when you combine chris reeve and rick hinderer you get a third brand of folding knife and i'm wondering if you know what that is we'll get to that in a second uh next up protech i was talking about people i'd like to give my money to i would like to give more money to protech uh dave uh wattenberg is so awesome the company is so awesome it's uh the people i've come in contact with uh from from protech are great and that means a lot. Uh, but what also means a lot are these amazing knives they make. This this was the um, knife that allowed me to get behind the wheel of the Les George VSEP and Rockeye design. One of my favorite folding knife designs of all time. Uh, I could not afford or, or find a VSEP when, I, when they came out with this. And I was so thrilled because this... Sometimes when you see a knife that you like go into production as a, uh, as a, what do you call it? Well, as a production knife, they will change the dimensions and uh, change it up a little bit. The dimensions are all the same here. And, um, and this is CPM D2. So this, this really allowed me to, like I said, get a knife I could, I could never get or thought I could never get. I ended up getting one in the future, but so Protec, great build, great out the side automatics um, and uh, button lock, uh, button lock non autos. I'm trying to get at. I, I need to. This is distracting me here. I'm going to turn this light down. It's 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 very bright. So please forgive me, people. All right. There we go. That's better. It was uh, flaring out a little bit. Um, so Protec, amazing action, amazing build, all this aluminum and. Uh, they are beautiful. Something I see in Microtech that I see in Protech is exquisite milling in aluminum. And you really get to see how jimping feels in aluminum from both of those brands. Like, I love it. It's, it's sharp without painful, you know, sharp without being painful, just truly engaging jimping. Here we don't have any of it on this aluminum, just on that, uh, on that blade. But on the other Microtechs I have, you see that. Uh, right now, I mean, uh, Protex. Right now, there are no Protex that I'm burning to get, except uh, one that is out of reach for me right now, and that's the Terzuola, and it's very expensive, but rightly so. Uh, there's a, uh, I would imagine, quite a nice royalty going to uh, Bob Terzuola for that, and well deserved. So, combining the incredible build of Protec and the great people behind that brand, and then the sort of people they collaborate with, Les George, um, Bob Terzuola and others great brand so i'm not getting rid of any don't ask <laughs> next up jack wolf knives there are there are a couple of reasons there are two two main reasons why i won't get rid of uh jack wolf knives the first one is this more selfish reason because they're really really awesome and i love each one of them and they all get a lot of carry some of them get doted over some of them get die jobs from uh, with the micarta and some of them are, are a little more loved than others but here is the perfect example of why i'm not going to get rid of any jack wolf knives uh because he shows innovation ben belkin has innovated the modern slip joint um by keeping it traditional but and by that i mean having having it all guided by the the kick and not a stop pin and he's gotten the engineering to such a fine point, especially with the slip joints in terms of their action, in terms of their fit and finish. And then he flexes into, oh, I think I'll design a bolster lock. And he does a perfect job right out of the gate. Uh, the only thing I say perfect 
The only thing I would change is maybe give a little bit better access to that lock bar, but only because I've heard other people say it. For me, it's fine. It's fine. Beautiful knives. Also, they've been gifts. Uh, and so that's another reason why I'll, I'll never get rid of them. I, I don't get rid of gift knives. People give me a knife, I keep it, even if it's one I don't like. Uh, but in this case, it's like gifts of the finest, finest knives. And I'm so psyched about them. So not getting rid of these, um, you know, unless I'm trading for for food uh, after the apocalypse. All right. Sorry, Ben. I might have to do that. Next up is this is the knife that I was saying is the combination of Chris Reeve and Rick Hinderer knives. Uh, this is the Spartan Harzi folder. Now, I'm not saying all Spartan folders are that combination because I just don't have the experience. I have more experience with the Spartan fixed blades. Uh, but this one from one of my favorite designers, Bill Harzi Jr., William Harzi Jr., uh, really encapsulates everything to me that uh, makes a, a folding tactical knife um, the kind I don't want to get rid of. It It is, well, first of all, great to the eye and great to the hand. Feels great in hand, this knife, and is beautiful. But when you look at the build of it, it is, it is as stout as these two knives and has that same feeling action. So it's got that sort of hinderer stoutness. Look at how, look at the standoffs on that. And then look at the standoffs on this like extra extra wide standoffs you can run these over with a car and they're not going to collapse on themselves so you got that super sturdy build and then you have the super smooth i'm sorry i keep saying super incredibly smooth action uh on the slow roll uh, that that super hydraulic uh washer action i'm such a sucker for it and this knife gives it to you in spades the one um it's not even a ding, but the one observation that if I had my druthers, I might change. But then again, maybe I wouldn't is the grind. I might make the grind a little, make it a little, uh, a little finer behind the edge, but this is very sharp and it's very robust. So, um, maybe not. I have considered many times having it reground and then I'm kind of to what end. And then I see Jared Neves when he had his uh, hollow ground and it looks so nice. So who knows? Maybe I will. Um, I am a sucker for a hollow grind. But in the meantime, this this is something I will never get rid of. Also, it has my logo emblazoned in it. Um, so there is a sentimental value, sentimental value to it. But uh, this is one I would never get rid of because it's a Spartan blade made in North Carolina uh, by by great folks. And I have uh, I have a couple of their fixed blades and I won't get rid of those either. So great designer uh, collaborations and incredible builds. So Spartan Blades right there. Next up, Emerson. You probably knew this This was coming. Emerson Knives. Never getting rid of any of my Emerson Knives. Uh, a couple were gotten rid of for me, stolen. Uh, and and then I have also given away and sold a couple. Uh, I, I gave a mini... Uh, mini cqc7 to jimmy slash and the funny thing is is now i think about it jimmy slash is a big dude he's got giant hands i gave him this mini i was like how did he open that thing uh but i've had a number of great emersons and i've let a few go uh whether on purpose or not and have made the decision that I'm not going to do that uh emerson is one of those knives that and 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 one of those makers, one of those people uh, that I want to give my full support. And um, part of that is acquiring as many of these as I can. <laughs> and and I'm not I don't I am not always looking for Emerson's. I've rarely, you know, but but when they come up, like recently, I did a trade for an Emerson uh, with my buddy Ian and I got that TKF uh, dash one and love it. And uh yeah, put it in there, and these will always be in the Knife Junkie collection, and this will be among, in the list of knives that I tell my girls, you know, uh, if you want to keep them, keep them, but if you want to sell them, you'll get good money for them. Uh, lastly, Cold Steel. Cold Steel, Cold Steel. I have gotten rid of a few, um, but not too many, and uh, and that's 
that's just my rule. I love these knives so much. And I got to say, it's more like which cold steel knives don't I want? That's kind of how I would like to collect them. Uh, and why, why is that? First of all, I love Lynn Thompson. He's a great person. And, um, before I knew that, because, you know, before I interviewed him and got to know him a little bit, uh, personally, um, and got to, you know, when you talk to someone for an, an hour and 20 minutes, you get a little feel for them. And I, what I suspected was true. And some of the things I suspected were not true. He was a very humble, um, and down to earth and warm guy. And, uh, and I always wondered if he would be awkward in an interview and he wasn't, he was, uh, very comfortable. I had a great conversation with that guy. Uh, but all of that notwithstanding, um, he has a brilliant, uh, mind and knowledge of historical knives and, uh, the whole spectrum of knives throughout history. And he has a, a huge collection and of historical knives. And then turns some of those into uh, modern, well-produced, uh, combat-ready uh, knives and swords. And I am so grateful to that. Like this. Uh, this is a modern version of a Navaja, my favorite, one of my favorite knives from history. The large Spanish folder uh, that was a locking folder adopted uh, by common-day Spaniards when they could no longer carry swords to settle their beefs. So they pull these giant knives, this and much larger, out of their cummerbunds and fight with them. And Cold Steel has done this countless, well, you could count, I just haven't, but many, many, many times they have taken uh, knives from history and given them new life, modern life, with these incredibly stout, sharp, uh, well-built folders and fixed blades and swords. And so Cold Steel, to me, uh, you know, I know they've gone through some patches where people don't like them. I think uh, I think they have reached um, saint status or what, what do you call it? They've reached kind of uh, unassailable status at this point. People used to like to to, to bust on them, uh, but I don't think anyone's busting on them anymore. I think people recognize how great they are. And then they made the transition uh, to GSM ownership. And thanks to uh, in great part to Stickman. Um, they have maintained, uh, they have really maintained uh, and have done great stuff and have been releasing great stuff. Some of the designs, the new designs, you know, without uh, Demco at the at the design helm and without uh, without um, without Lynn Thompson designing a lot of the knives. Some of them are a little ham fisted, I gotta say. The mayhem, or wait. What is that called? Yeah, the the big no 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 the the big swashbuckling folder. Yeah, the mayhem. Eh, it's a it's a little little much, uh, but I'd like to get one for sure. But my point is, Cold Steel is a great company uh, with a great past and a great present, and I believe they'll they'll have a they'll keep doing this. I I think the people who have it now love it, and I think they will uh, maintain the spirit of Cold Steel, uh, a knife brand I will not part with. All right. What are your knife brands? Some people I know are Benchmade fanatics. A lot of people in law enforcement that I've met. Uh, um, K-Bar. What is it? Tell me what are the brands you will not part with uh, if you have that luxury. Right now, I have that luxury. Who knows? Down the road, I might be forced to part with these. But for now, thank God I get to hold on to them. All right. Be sure to join us tomorrow night for Thursday Night Knives and Sunday for a great interview. I love this. I love doing everything. I love Thursday Night Knives. I love talking with you guys. Uh, I love doing this show and, and catching up with the knife world. But to me, you know, the heart and soul are these interviews, getting to know the knife makers that are creating these things that we collect obsessively. All right. Thanks uh, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher. I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time. Don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear 
hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.